Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 62. This episode is Alex Backus. Alex, apart from just being awesome, uh, is also the other half of Black Series Rebels, which is a fantastic Star Wars uh, YouTube show. Highly recommend. Definitely check them out. Check out their episodes. They're great. Check out their pins. Also great. Can't recommend them enough. Uh, but we talk about how Alex uh, basically chased the dream, man. He packed up and moved down to Los Angeles. And we talk about him uh, getting his start uh, acting. We talk about how he's now a, a commercial actor. It's what he does for a living. So we cover uh, crazy audition stories with that. We talk about his past roommate, Roy, who sounds like the greatest person ever. Uh, we talk about him studying at Second City and how he went to uh, – uh, he worked on a cruise ship, which – uh, if you hear him say it, uh, it may not be as glamorous as uh, as you might imagine. Uh, but we also talk about his show, Shark Bites, which is fantastic. Definitely check that out. There's puppets. I like puppets. If you're listening to this, probably a safe bet that you like puppets too. Uh, but Alex is hilarious. Great dude. I uh, feel like we, we have the same sense of humor, so we got along very, very well. Uh, yeah, so without further ado, here is the interesting podcast, episode number 62 with Alex Backus. Theme song time. Good. We've maintained contact now. Uh, the Alex Backus I <laughs> Skyped a minute ago was not you. So <laughs> there's another Alex Backus on Skype at Th- this moment. There's a few, strangely enough, and Should one we... of them is in L.A. as well. <laughs> Wait, really? Yeah, how weird is that? Oh, I don't like that. I know. I like... You know what this means. You have to hunt him down and kill him, and then you become Wait. stronger. Should we call him in and have you interview a strange Alex Backus than you, normal Alex? Can after? you imagine? <laughs> That'd be awesome. Uh, and it, the the title of the episode would just be Alex Backus Squared. Yes, like, or like understand. Bizarro <laughs> Backus. Exactly. We'll find out how similar you are. There's another Brian Balance who's from the exact same place that I am, but we're not related. It's weird. This is so weird. I don't know how to feel about it. I'm looking at like Alex Backus's in Los Angeles and sorry dude I am <laughs> top of Google you got nothing you there got you go. nothing other Alex Backus SEO man that's what matters Wait. here <laughs> oh no it says Alex Backus has been arrted <gasps> <Question mark. laughs> oh wait and it says Alex Backus has been found what is happening <laughs> awesome right right <laughs> That's why I don't Google myself. That's true. I don't. I would never Google myself, but now Fair. maybe I should. I mean, there's only one uh, way to know the true depth of the back as hole and the internet. <laughs> <laughs> That's your baby. one. It's good, man. It's good. Been really busy getting ready for Comic-Con and doing all that stuff, which yeah. champagne, always champagne problems, but also extremely stressful. So we'll get, we'll get through it. Yeah, you will. You guys are killing it. But congrats again, by the way. That's amazing. That's the mecca. Thanks, man. You made it. Yeah, dude. It's it's crazy. I, I've been before as a as a attendee, but I've never done anything like this before. And if you had told me a year ago that our silly show would have this, right? <laughs> I would have I would have laughed in your face and been like, "You're a maniac." <laughs> and now look at you. Look at you, Alex. Look at it, man. Dude, hey, man. It's amazing. So let's, just, let's just talk about other Alex Backuses in Los Angeles. Let's do it. And just... Let's plot how you're uh, going to win. The tournament begins praise, at San Diego praise. Comic-Con. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. Praise me the whole time and then just really mock the other Alex Backus who may or may not have been arrested. We don't, we don't know. He was <laughs> definitely arrested, but was he found is the question. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. you know this is, this is the, 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 the Alex Backus issue that I want to dive into. Is this one? Here? It would, it would be great if, like, while we're doing the show at Comic Con, 
like 15 cops. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> be like, we got him. That's this right. Guy's, this guy murdered 14 people and he's got multiple women and children locked up in his basement. <laughs> like, oh, I swear, I, I didn't do it. And Steve's like, it's him. Like, Steve, right, yeah. totally Steve would definitely along under the it. bus. <laughs> yeah. It's Just like, to see where it him. goes, you know. That's yeah. a real friend, though. It's like you, you yeah. got to you got to see where it goes. Always, hey man, I don't want to doubt what you do. I'm yeah. just, gonna, <laughs> just gonna trust you. That's right. You know, if that's what you want to do, I support it. Like a good friend. <laughs> totally. I'm yeah. into it. I'm into. It. I've never been to San Diego Comic Con. What is what is it like? As a fan, uh, the, I've never been at all. So the way I like to describe. San Diego Comic Con. I've been three times. I only ever go for a day. I could never do it for more than one day. I like to describe it as 200,000 people that all want to go to the exact same place as you at the exact same time. Oh, God. It's awful. <laughs> it is like, it. it is, it, you know, like if um, I don't have this reoccurring nightmare, but I feel like there are people that have that reoccurring nightmare where they're chasing something and they can never catch it. Oh yes, that's yeah. the that is the feeling of Comic Con. You're never gonna get what you want, <laughs> <laughs> so you might as well just like find a safe corner right. and hope <laughs> and hope that everything turns out okay. That's fair. That sounds like a good way to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh man, yeah. I just the sheer number of people, I I can't imagine. I mean, the craziest thing I've done as far as that would be like you know waiting overnight at Celebration, because that was bonkers. But even oh, that yeah. doesn't have Comic Con numbers. It is. It, it's it's definitely close. It's definitely like that. That that's probably the sensation of like Hall H, which I would right. would never wait for ever. And no judgment to anyone that would. Like I love things. I just don't love them enough to wait for two days. <laughs> line. Like fair. I, yeah. I, even it, I don't, I don't know what it would have to be like, Hey, the cast of Seinfeld is going to be <laughs> doing a script reading of empire strikes back cosplaying as the ghostbusters and characters from back to the future. And like, 90s east bay punk bands are gonna do the music <laughs> and they're doing might, the signing afterwards <laughs> yeah and they're doing it and it's you're the only one in the audience yeah. and they and they're all gonna hang out with you afterwards. Right. I, I, I might wait two days for that that's fair that's fair that's your line <laughs> sounds awesome see i should put on comic-con that sounds like right, just see? call it bacchus con it's just right. all things i really like nobody else wants to go and then <laughs> that'll be the real trap for the other alex bacchus is there yeah, if, if they show up, you've lured them into a false sense of security. Mm -hmm. I like See? it. It's not that hard. Yeah. I could be a cop too. Yeah, right. all be... <laughs> I am a cop, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> this is the line of communication we've been waiting for. Is it? Yeah, oh no! I just have to keep you on from everything that I've seen on TV. I just have to keep you on the line long enough to establish a tracking connection. I really want to hang up on you just for this <laughs> bit, but I don't want to ruin your show. I appreciate so. I appreciate that. Anyone who can commit to the bit, I'm into it. <laughs> That's awesome. awesome. Well, thank, thank you for having me. I don't know what on earth I could possibly talk about for this long, but I'm sure I could find something. Steve, I'm not I'm not the talker like Steve. I know. <laughs> Steve's Steve really so hit, great. Steve hit you with it, man. I love it. He really it. gave you the gave you this gave you the story. Oh, dude, I'm getting yours too. Don't don't you fret, my friend. No, we'll dude, see. I did. <laughs> I did an episode. The longest one to date so far is a guy named Details, and he's a creature performer who's been in the last. Uh, actually, he's been in all the new Star Wars movies. And we I feel like three hours. I feel like I I know who that is. I yeah, feel like you definitely yeah. know his characters. Uh, the most recent was in Solo. He was the the Pike that like came out with the keys mm -hmm. that Kira. Yes, up. that's D. Yep. Mm -hmm. And he's like the guy who's laughing. In, yes, uh, in, in Force Awakens, yep. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he was uh, a droid in Rogue One, and then he was slow and low in Episode Eight, the one that like basically tells on Finn and Rose and gets him arrested. That's D as well. Uh but Joseph Gordon-Levitt's doing the voice. Correct, that's him. Gotcha. Oh, yep. All right, that's D. So we talked for three hours because he was in a boy band in the '90s that I knew of, and I was like, we need to talk about what that's like opening for Janet Jackson. What? Whoa! Is yeah. that why he's? Is that why he goes by the name Details? Because that sounds like that's his real of... name. 
Oh, really? Dead serious. It totally sounds like a stage name. Uh, That's right? awesome. I know. I was like, dude, you were destined for all of these things right out oh, the gate. Oh, yeah. 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 Is it D-E-E, D -E -E, yep. then space Tails? Correct. First name D, last name Tails. That's rad. Right? He's, oh, a, that's he's like, so funny. That's like being named Buster Posey. <laughs> like, the name Buster Posey, he only could play baseball. I know, yeah. He can't do anything else. You're right. right. You're right. There are mm -hmm. some people you're just, you're you're destined or damned by your name. Absolutely. You know? Claude Giroux was born to be a hockey player. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> Fair. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so it, it's it's uh, I mean, you heard you heard Steve's episode. It's very relaxed. It's just kind of a fun little free flow kind of thing. Um, right. But I did ask him the same question. But I gotta ask you: You're not from LA, are you? Because I feel like few I'm, people are. I am. I've been in Los Angeles for oh, it'll be 14 years in September. So Good I'm job. not originally from Los Angeles. I I grew up in Northern California, like Steve. But he grew up in. Uh, the South Bay, like the San Jose area, mm -hmm. and I I grew up in the East Bay in a town called Pleasanton, about I love it, about twenty minutes outside of Oakland. Okay. okay. So yeah, if you've been to the Bay Area, I'm I was literally the last stop on BART. If you're taking BART in from San, which is like our public transit, if right. L train if you're from Chicago or subway if you're in New York, but. It basically was a commuter train you could take from San Francisco all the way east to the last stop, which was my town that I grew up in. Gotcha, gotcha. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. So when yeah. did you when did you start getting into acting? Because I've seen all of your reels, and <laughs> dude, <laughs> dude, dude, uh... <laughs> I so let me tell you something. I live in Florida. Okay. And okay. <laughs> and I have this like weird taste in my mouth when I call myself an actor even though I've been in like a few features and shorts and like I I've done some things, but I still I'm like, "Oh god, to say I'm an actor cuz like, you know, everyone's an actor kind of thing." But uh -huh. like you've done some legit stuff. Ah, so thanks, man. I got I got it. when did where did that start? When did it start? Talk to me. Well, for one, you're not alone. I don't know of any actor that enjoys saying that they're an actor. It's weird. It's right? like it's the weirdest. It the feels weirdest. pretentious, doesn't it? Oh, it, well, you know what it is? It's because people who are not in a creative field, mm -hmm. when they hear somebody tell them that they're in a creative field, they automatically have a preconceived notion of what that means. So if yes. I say to someone, "Hey, I'm an actor," they immediately assume. Oh, you're a waiter. Right. <laughs> I, I've never seen you in anything, so naturally I would just assume, and rightfully so. Nothing on those people that makes perfect sense. Like, oh, yeah. in a lot of in a lot of people's mind, being an actor means, oh, you're George Clooney. It's like, n no, yeah, right. It, it's it, it's it's a blue collar job. There's oh, a very few amount of actors that are working regularly that are making massive amounts of money, right? Like anything. Absolutely. If like if you think about your standard company, right? You've got the the folks who work in the the department store. Then you've got the managers of the department store and bop it up all the way up to the CEO of the department store and you know, the George Clooney's and the Tom Hanks, those are the board of directors, the Meryl Streep's of the world. Right. Those are like the board of directors of actors. I'm like I don't know. I'd consider myself maybe like I manage a department. <laughs> of the department so. Fair. Fair. So, the really uh, cool I, department. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, to answer your question, I got into acting when I was a kid. I mean, like anybody, I, I was on, I was in like the improv club in middle school. Nice. And that, that I, all I really cared about in middle school was watching Tom Green. The oh, Tom Green oh show. yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh Yes. The Tom Green Show and CKY videos. Oh, Those were like the two things that I love watching. So I used to – I didn't un really understand improv at age 13. I thought I could just go up and like do Tom Green. Right. Like, a Tom, <laughs> like a Tom Green impression. I was like, ha he's doing Tom Green. This is great. And like I just – I don't know. I, I'm not good at a lot of things. Same. But the the <laughs> one thing that I always felt like, oh, I'm pretty good at this is making people laugh. I've just naturally been able to do it. Oh, yeah. Uh, for most of my life, even as a kid, I just loved making my parents laugh, making my friends laugh. And that's the only – like if you distilled down the one thing that I've 
always known I want to do. It's just make people laugh. Sure. However I do it, it doesn't matter, but I just like making people laugh. So that's probably been with me my whole life. And then like everybody, you know, I did school plays. I did musicals in high school. I was in the the fall play. We did a we did a play in the fall and a musical in the spring like every other high school probably does. And uh-huh. then at 18 years old, I knew I wasn't go to I wasn't going to go to college. I had no interest ever. Like I I never had an interest and my parents knew that from mm-hmm. like age 14, no pressure whatsoever. I told them at age 17 when I turn 18 and I graduate, I'm going to get in the car and I'm going to move to Los Angeles and be an actor. Wow. And they went, and they went, okay, didn't fight me. Didn't, didn't disagree. They, they, they were totally supportive. Now I have some family that's worked in the industry before, not like not famous type of folks, but mm-hmm. I have a, my aunt was a director and her ex-husband worked on Jurassic park. No he was like way. a special, yeah, he was a special effects supervisor, not the supervisor, but he did like, forget what he did. It was like special effect computer design or something. Just look up Michael Bacchus. What? He'll pop. Yeah. Look up Michael Bacchus. He's worked on almost all the Michael Crichton movies. Dude. Cause Michael, Michael Crichton was his best friend growing up. Um, what? But, uh, yeah, yeah. That's he was amazing. really good. friend. Yeah. But like, again, I should, I should reiterate, I've never done a Michael Crichton movie or like <laughs> yet in, in anything <laughs> they've done. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that, so that was, I think for them, they understood that there are a lot of things you can do that doesn't mean like, oh, hey, he's famous. Cause that's like, it's, you know, I don't want to ever tell anyone that their dreams are unrealistic, but I, I would say if you're moving to Los Angeles to be famous, I would say that's an unrealistic goal. Fair. And I would, I would check your expectations at the door and maybe say like, Hey, Maybe instead of wanting to be famous, my goal is to get an agent, (laughs) be working, to be able to make enough money to pay rent in Los Angeles, I would say, is a good sign that you're successful. (laughs) So I think for me, it was just a matter of getting down here and just finding my own community. And once, once I did that, I was off to the races. Yeah. Dude. That's crazy. You're you're one of those stories. Pack a bag and just chase the dream. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, it's it's weird. Like when you say it like that, at, at the time, it didn't seem like it was such a crazy thing to do. But yeah, now I realize how, you know, folks hear that and they go, "Oh God, I could never do that," or "Oh, I really <laughs> want to do that." And if anybody's listening to this right now, and you're you've been thinking or dreaming about doing something like that, I don't know your situation, but I would tell you to do it anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just tell you to do it. It's better than always wondering what could have been. Oh, absolutely. I think that we are blessed with uh, a very limited amount of time. Agreed. On this earth, and you should be happy during that time. As you know, obviously, life is different for everybody and more complicated than that. But it's not hard to stop and look at what's going on in your life and say, "Hey, what's going to make me happy?" And I'm going to do that. I totally you know? agree. Totally yeah. agree. I'm always saying that as well. It's like life is incredibly short. So anytime yeah. you're not wasting on something that makes you happy, hey, what are you doing? You know, you don't yeah. you don't have time at the end of the day. That's like the biggest regret that a lot of like old people say at the end of their lives. They're like, wish I would have done this instead of this. Yeah. Okay. And I don't I don't want to do that. Me neither. I That's that's yep. a recurring nightmare, isn't it? <laughs> so, <laughs> Yeah, so, man. So you had peop- you have family members that were in the industry. So I'm assuming you'd been to LA before. Uh, yeah, I mean, growing up in California, like you know, a trip to Los Angeles was a pretty standard like family vacation. So I went with my my mom and dad to Disneyland oh, a lot. Right, right, and, right. Yeah, so we would go to Disneyland, um, sometimes Universal Studios, uh, but hanging out in LA. Not really. Like I had been there a few times, but most of my time would have been spent in Anaheim <laughs> than sure. like L.A. proper. Sure. Um, I went to when L.A. I... a couple years ago. Oh, yeah? I, did, I didn't realize that Los Angeles and Los Angeles County are two different things. And it's like Los yes. Angeles County is like 80 cities within Los Angeles, whereas Los mm-hmm. Angeles is a very specific sect of the whole valley thing. 
which I'm is kidding. you know you know what's really weird is if you look at Los Angeles, there are parts of it that don't even connect to each other. Ooh, that's so so weird. like yeah, there are parts of the city of Los Angeles where like West Hollywood will be like bronk and like <laughs> pop like curve into it. Same thing with like Mid Wilshire or Beverly Hills or San like it's kind of this like weird then there's downtown, then there's, you know, Koreatown, which is technically not a town, but it's a part of like it's a very weird sort of it it's definition of sprawl. Yeah. Los yeah. Angeles. <laughs> You're right. You're right. So how often do you come out? Uh, I've only been the once. I uh, Ooh. yeah, my uh, my mom and I did this whole big thing where we were like making bucket lists. We're like, mm-hmm. if we if we could make a bucket list now, as opposed to like you know when you get older, you're like, oh, running out of time. Better scribble some things. It's like yeah. if you make some things now and live the life you want to live now, what would be some things on there? And she made some stuff, and I made some stuff, and uh, a lot of our things were the real touristy type stuff in Los Angeles. So we just booked it like. Uh, we had a week, we had a week or two weeks, I think it might have been two weeks, uh, in Los Angeles, and then we did all that stuff, and then took a train to San Diego, and then we were oh, there nice. for like four or five days, and then went back to LA, and uh, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's, its, own, it's its own little ecosystem, that place. So like, I'm assuming Grauman's Chinese Theater, Oh yeah. the Ho- Hollywood Walk of Fame, the Hollywood Sign. All of it. All of it. All of it? Nice. All of it. it was great. It's like, this is where Pretty Woman was filmed. And we're like, oh, it is. <laughs> 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 this is the stairwell. <laughs> I think my only time that something le- cool like that happened to me as a professional was I was at an audition for Desperate Housewives yes. on the, the Universal lot. And oh, I, um, I was walking back there just like from I was walking back to my car from like the cubicle where they were having the not the cubicle, like the portable Uh where they were having the audition and the universal tram like drove by me and people were like taking pictures of me and stuff. (laughs) It's an actor. Oh, yeah. They I'm like, I have my little head chat. I'm like, oh, boy. It's like I just auditioned to say like. You know, one latte coming up or something. <laughs> it was like not cool at all. But I was like, hey, that's kinda that's kinda fun to like be on the the universal someone's universal tour experience was fun. Yeah. They got to see but, a real working actor. <laughs> a real auditioning actor. <laughs> a real yeah, they got to see a re, a <laughs> real working actor. Not an actor, but a real working actor. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. yeah, we we went to the we we wanted to go to the Griffith Observatory, and that was hard to say. And we uh, couldn't find the road for some reason. I don't know. The maps was being weird, so we ended up hiking up like Runyon Canyon. And then when we got to the yeah. top, we're like, "Oh man, we're really tired now." And then we saw a parking lot, and we're like, "What is that? We could have drove." Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <so. laughs> it's confusing because there's Griffith Park, and then there's the Griffith Park Observatory. And the park is like a big sprawling park with the hiking trails. That's but the we observatory <laughs> has this weird road that goes like by the Greek theater. Mm-hmm. And then like, go. it's like, oh, it's weird. It's, it's another like six or seven blocks from the park to get to drive up to the observatory. That's why it is confusing. That it's actually where I, pro- where I proposed to my fiance was at the top of what? the Griffith Park Observatory. Yeah. I love it. It's a good I place. A I had to pick a place that we'd never been that had we had no emotional attachment to because she's like a <laughs> bloodhound. She would like she would put it together in a. If I was like, "Hey, let's go up to this little spot on Mahala," and she'd be like, "Why?" <laughs> right. <laughs> or like, "Hey, let's go to Second City." Why? I was like, "Oh boy." So I was just like, "Hey, let's go to Griffith Park." She's like, "Okay." <laughs> yeah, and you're like, "You boob." <laughs> got you i got you you sucker you that's weren't expecting amazing. that on a thursday night in february <laughs> that's right ha ha I, I i used to joke all the time because I, I just got married uh, a month ago and Woo-hoo! yeah thank you uh so i used to joke all the time with my now wife whenever she would do something really cool i'd be like you know what you know what it's time it's time and i'd pretend like i'm gonna pull out a ring and propose to her right there so oh, yeah she'd be like hey you want to watch star wars i was like you know what that's it final straw <laughs> and so, and so I'd joke around, and uh, so when I proposed to her, I actually proposed to her uh, in a movie theater after a movie, uh, after the credits, and um, oh, I, I had to like prep her first. I'd be like, "This is for real," and she's like, "What? What do you mean?" And then got on one knee, and she was like, <gasps> "So same, uh, same sort of thing." You what movie it. was it? It was uh, Flatliners. 
the remake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's awesome. That's right. No regrets. <laughs> You have made a memory out of maybe not a great movie. I haven't seen I, it, and dude, I love that. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. We actually, she asked me, she's like, if the movie sucked, would you have proposed? I was like, eh, probably not. Not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, she's like a big horror movie fan. So it was in October, uh, and it was like this mm-hmm. whole big thing. I was like, I got to throw her off, because for the same reason. You're like, you want to go out to a nice dinner? You're like, hmm. I won. What? Why? Yeah, it's exactly. It's Tuesday. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Mm-hmm. Same. Mm-hmm. So you went to L.A. You said it's different hanging out in L.A. Where did you hang out? Where did you start? What uh, so when I when I moved out when I was 18, I lived in uh, this. Oh, my gosh. The <laughs> worst, the worst apartment you can imagine in uh, Santa Monica, because you just think, oh, Santa Monica is supposed to be nice. But you don't know. <laughs> you don't know at 18 that it's like ungodly expensive right it's so you're like beach. oh yeah th- this should be this should be cheap it was this little apartment off ashland in santa monica and we had a our tenant his i mean the the landlord his name was charles and he was from ireland oh, and he yes. must he must have been 102 years old <laughs> so like my guilt couldn't handle like watching him hose down the sidewalk. So oh, I just no. like, Charles, why don't you go inside? And I would do that work for him. Uh, Cause like this, I, I can't watch, I can't watch this 102 year old man. Like, Hey Charles, uh, our light bulbs out. I'll come and fix it. It's like, no, 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 <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that. Just leave the light bulb on the porch, buddy. I'll take care of it. But that was my first, my first apartment in LA, but I only lived there for, I want to say three months. Um, Mm -hmm. I had moved down with two friends from like drama in high school. One was moving down here to be a singer. The other one wanted to be a musician. And I was the only one that moved down here to be an actor. And they're, they're fantastic people. I love them. But like, we are not, there's no way they're going to listen to this. So I can say it (laughs) definitely not like good roommates. Uh Like they, they were clearly in love with each other, but they were both in long distance relationships. So uh, I would, I would, I would watch them like just argue and fight with their like boyfriend and girlfriend back home and then sleep with each other at night. <laughs> it was, dude, it was so weird. And I mean, we're, I'm like 18 and I was like, what is going on? This is so like, I'm sharing a room with this guy. I wake up, he wouldn't be in his bed. He'd like be in there. I'm like, oh God, this is so weird. And so <laughs> I think they were like, I had already, so I met this dude and this, this is, I'll tell this story in length, but and long story short, I meet this dude in acting class and I'm for sure we, we're going to get a place that's cheaper and in the Valley, which is not too much further away, but way cheaper and way nicer. Mm-hmm. And I'm like a total people pleaser. And I was so terrified to tell them that I didn't want to live with them. <laughs> and uh, I came home from Christmas like I went home for Christmas and came back and they had left a note on my bed that was like, you should move out. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, <laughs> I, I'm not offended because I was planning on doing that anyway. But also like, what the fuck did I, I do? I'm not, the, I'm not the, by the way, I'm sorry if I can't swear. I'll try my oh, best. No, dude, swear not, all you want. Not, okay, I'll, I will do my best. Apologies. Don't judge me. I oh, have you're a fine. <laughs> foul mouth. Um, I was like, what did I do? I didn't. I'm not the one being weird in this situation. <laughs> you don't it's get horrible. to break up with me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It really was. It was like, imagine if like, you were in a relationship with someone and she had just cheated on you for years and years and like beat you and was awful, <laughs> awful, awful. And you came home and she's like, I don't think this is working. And you're like, are you kidding me? I've done nothing but dedicate my life to you. How can, what? But in a weird way, I was like, I don't know why I'm, I shouldn't be mad about this, but so I ended up moving out, which ended up being great, but also very hard. Cause that was like totally ripping off the Northern California home band aid. Right. That was when I, so we're like five, six months in, and this is the truth. I'm not, we don't need to get like weird. When we I first moved <laughs> My, when I first moved down to L.A., uh, I probably weighed like 135, mm-hmm. and just from the stress and anxiety of five months living on my own at 18 – sorry, you're going to hear – I live by the Burbank Airport. You're going to hear a plane. Oh, maybe. you're fine. Um, and within a month, I had dropped to 108 pounds. Oh, man. Dude, I couldn't eat. 
I couldn't sleep. I couldn't keep anything down when I did eat. My anxiety was so bad. Yeah. I was so scared. I was so nervous. I didn't understand how to be an adult. Fair. I was like this 18 year old kid with a car and a bed and an acting class that he went to t- twice a week. And the rest of the time I was like, what am I doing? Like, what am I doing right now? Right. And it was so terrifying at 18 to be doing that, that when I met this guy, Roy, who is a 30 year old from Brooklyn nice. in my acting class, he was looking for a place. I needed a, a, a new situation to get more focused and feel more comfortable. Right. And him and I just, we didn't hit it off, but we could tell that we were compatible as roommates. Right. And he said, you want to move in with me in the Valley? And I just went, yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> so at 18 years old, about six months into LA, met a friend named Roy in an acting class and we moved into a two bedroom apartment in Sherman Oaks. And this is, you could not think of a more odd couple, right? <laughs> You've got a 30-year-old dude from Brooklyn who's in L.A. acting, an 18-year-old from Northern California who just moved to L.A., never lived alone, is like struggling to even find his place. And at first we were like oil and water, sure. but then slowly but surely we found out that we both like – the same kind of video games we both like the same not the same kind of music but we like the same genre Mm -hmm. of music we ended up really hitting it off and i mean i say this meeting that guy and living with just taking that plunge like jumping headfirst into the water that saved my life yeah like i i i I, I, honest dude i would have withered away or i would have left los angeles and never kept going but because I became such close friends with this guy that by any other any other reason, if some if like an eighteen year old called their parents and said, Hey, I'm moving in with this thirty year old I just met, they'd be like, What are you talking about? No, you're not. But my folks were like, Okay, like totally casual. They came down, they met him. My de- like Roy is also too like totally comfortable and my friendship with him today, he's like the most handsome man in the world. <laughs> and he's also the most charming man in the world. Amazing. And he just charmed my mom and my dad. And they're like, yeah, Roy's great. And to this day, I would say Roy is probably my best friend, if not one of my best friends. And dude. we both sort of, yeah, dude, we, we hit the pavement together. We, he's been, he was a big encouraging factor for an 18 year old kid to, to know what to do, what type of people to meet and where to go. And, you know, he was, I, at the time, like anything, didn't realize what a crazy thing I was doing, which, you know, it's weird. That, that might even be a theme of our conversation at the time. Right. I never, I never understood that what I was doing was not ordinary or was kind of crazy. Right. And because I just did it, and didn't have a fear about it, it ended up working out better than anyone would have thought or imagined. So that was, that was like a, that was my first sort of friend I made in LA. And because of Roy, truthfully, because of Roy, every great thing that's happened in my life since being in Los Angeles is because of him, just because he was willing to move in with an 18 year old kid. And like, we 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 made an effort to get to know each other two strangers becoming friends and i will always be grateful to that guy because that he he's the real reason that i'm a working actor in los angeles it's because of roy which is so crazy and strange but it, he absolutely <laughs> is the reason that's but, amazing it yeah. sh- goes to show like just the the value of a friend you know, like, yes. dude, encouragement will send people so much farther than they even thought they could go. And yep. it's such a such an interesting, like almost magic of life. If you've got the right people around you, it's just even, cool. Yeah. Even just like being around people that you can be yourself with. A hundred percent. That that to me is something that I don't think enough people do. Agreed. 
actually finding friends that you can be your 100% self with is an amazing gift and hard to accomplish. But when you do, you know it. And that was Roy, dude. It took a while. But I mean, my favorite Roy stories are and everybody, Roy, everybody knows this about Roy. And now your listeners are about <laughs> to know this about Roy. But he is, like I said, the most handsome man anyone would ever meet in person. Mm -hmm. So a 30 year old handsome single man like that, All right. right, rightfully so was living a, a, we would say a healthy lush bachelor <laughs> life, lush bachelor lifestyle in Los Angeles. And some of my favorite moments, dude, are like, he would come home. He's 30. He'd go out to a bar. He'd come home with a lovely actress or model <laughs> in Los Angeles. I'm a 18 year old boy playing resident <laughs> evil on the TV on the couch downstairs. They would come in. He'd be like, we Roy and I always do. We have this dumb joke where we call each other names that aren't our names. So he <laughs> it's dumb. He'll be like, what's going on, Billy? I'll be like, what up, Frankie? Like, and they would come in like, Frank, I thought your name was Roy. He's like, don't worry about it. They go upstairs. You know, they have a an amazing, I would assume, two hours of lovemaking. <laughs> I'm downstairs still just playing Resident Evil Respect. and like clockwork every single night they would come down by themselves. <laughs> he would <laughs> stay up there. They would come down by themselves. They would have to cross me again by the TV <laughs> and I would say, have a nice night. And they would walk out the door. It was amazing. And no joke, Roy would then come down like 10 minutes later, be like, Billy, you want to get some Carl's Jr.? <laughs> and we would hop in the car and we would go to Carl's Jr. at like two in the morning. And it oh was, God, that was great. my three, that was three years of my life in LA. And it was, I, I like, I cherish that time because it was so strange and so spectacular and so weird. But that to me is like the quintessential Roy story right there. Like that, if, if you want to know what it was like for Alex Backus <laughs> at, at 18 to 20 in Los Angeles, that's it right there. Oh but, my God, that's great. That's <laughs> yeah, I mean, because of Roy, I mean, like I said, because of Roy, that that is the reason why all of my opportunities ended up opening up. He encouraged me to go to Second City. He encouraged me to take – improv classes because that's what i he knew i really wanted to do yeah and he pushed me to go do that because of improv i got an agent i got a commercial agent because of improv i booked my first jobs because of improv i made my real community of friends in los angeles besides my friends from los angeles that san francisco that have since moved down but you know my core friends that i've made in la really are through second city or various improv theaters that I've studied at and performed at and been a part of for now almost 12 years. And you know, it's weird. I, I don't talk about it a lot on the, on our podcast mm -hmm. because you know, it's mostly about star Wars, but sure. I mean, sure. I love star Wars, but improv really is like, that is the love of my life. I love it more than anything. Like I, it just something deep in my soul and spirit just really resonates when I'm doing it. And like I said, the only thing I've known I wanted to do is make people laugh. If you said, Alex, what's the one thing you're good at? I would say improv. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very proud of my, my, um, what I've studied and what I've learned and the shows that I've done. I mean, I've probably done now 5,000 improv shows in my life all over the country. And it's just because of those little chance moments, I, signed up for a school and started taking classes and really found out what I really love. So I will always be grateful for, to Roy yeah. always. Dude, that's Amen. amazing. So you, when you got to LA, you immediately started taking classes. Classes mm -hmm. are very, very like from what I've learned, uh, through having a lot of actors on my show is like classes are invaluable. It's crazy. That's, that's what it's all about, man. It's how you find your community. It's how you meet your friends. It's how you learn what you should and should not do. It's what keeps you acting when nobody else wants you to be acting. Right. <laughs> like it, 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 it is, I mean that, that classes are the most important thing you could be doing at any given time as an actor in Los Angeles. I still take classes. I take an on camera class every Monday and I've been doing it for three years with this one teacher really? every Monday, every Monday I go, she assigns me a script and I get in front of a camera and I practice auditioning. Wow. So I, 
still do it. And I took, I took even after working for Second City and doing the cruise ships for them for years, what? I I still took improv classes at different theaters from level one. I would take level one all the way through level four. Dude, yeah, we cannot just glaze over that. <laughs> you worked on a cruise ship. Yeah, man, I worked. I worked for the Second City. I did sketch and improv aboard the Norwegian Dawn, my friend. What? For yeah, dude, for for I guess it would be seven months. They extended our thing by a month. While yeah, they we were do on. contracts. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they do how was that? Yeah. Awful. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> awful. It's awful. Like I, I won't even. I, my that's the one thing that my mom gets really mad about is whenever people find out that I'm on, worked on a cruise ship, they're always so excited. They want to hear about it. They go, "What was that like?" And I go, "Terrible." And my mom goes, <laughs> "Alex, Alex, come on. Be, try to be a little bit positive." And I remember when I right when I got back from the boats, I was telling someone I was like, "It was terrible. I, I hated it." As I was doing it, and she goes, "Alex, stop." And I looked at her. I was like, <laughs> and I remember. I don't know why. I, this is totally not my style. I said something like. Mom, why are you denying my truth? <laughs> or something like that. And she was like, what, what the hell is this kid talking about? But yeah, no, I worked on a cruise ship for uh, nine months, which had a lot of amazing things about it. But mm -hmm. mo most importantly, I would say it's a it's a it's an experience that I did not enjoy <laughs> and would never do again. Wow. Uh, yeah. Oof, oof. Really? What made it different than like sketch comedy? I'm assuming you were on stage doing improv shows? Yeah, so basically what I would do is I would do two sketch shows and two improv shows and two workshops over a 7-day cruise. So, wow. you ended up working you'd end up working about 4 out of the 7 days and then 3 of the days you're just chilling, which mm -hmm. again is what it's like it's like champagne problems, but the 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 truth is, man, you're living on a boat. <laughs> like I'm living I I lived on a cruise ship. It's not That's my, true. My, I you're in a that. Room, you're in the room, I guarantee you, the size of half of your bedroom at home, if not a quarter. Mm -hmm. You've got a bathroom. You know like you know, like a half bath in oh, a yeah. bathroom that, that's just a toilet and a sink? Yep. You have that with a shower in it. Oh, boy. Yeah. Like that's what you have for nine months. And you've got this little tiny bed. You've got a little TV that only has the crew channels that the crew – that people taking a cruise – watch oh yeah so i don't know if you've ever taken a cruise but it's like i have it's like <laughs> i'm gonna watch programs <laughs> exactly like i'm gonna watch cruise programming like i'm gonna find out what's going on at you know on this on this spinnaker deck at five o'clock like i work here <laughs> like what am i you know so you end up traveling with like a lot of dvds you end up buying a lot of dvds when you're at shore on shore so you can have stuff to watch but again another theme right is to get through that the best thing was to meet people and mm -hmm. create a community and become friends with I, I became friends with a lot of people that I would consider to be some of my some of the best folks I've ever met. And I loved every minute I was doing the shows. And I loved a lot of the nights on the cruise ship. It was the days that were insufferable. Sure. Because you're not doing anything. So like from. I mean, I probably would wake up at one o'clock because for what I was doing, I was waking up at 1 p.m., right. wake up at 1, 1 p.m. And I didn't do anything until 6 p.m. I just sat around. I didn't do any. There was nothing to do. Right. Or, or I could get off the boat if we were ported and walk around. But even then I was like, meh, I don't really care. Right. Um, <laughs> Man, I never but, thought about that because a cruise. Yeah, it's like on, on the long side because I've taken a few cruises, but, you know, it's a week. But to think yeah. if you're on a boat for nine months, it's a very different story. It's like that, imagine living in, living in a room half the size of the room you were in, eating that cruise food every day for nine months. I'd get so fat. Oh, yeah. Dude. <laughs> yeah. You get fat. And on top of that, dude, the food's free. Oh, man. Yeah, forget Eat about free, it. Which is great. Not complaining there. Having free food was fantastic. But <laughs> – Beer and cider and wine and, you know, like Smirnoff Ices or 50 cents. What? So basically, yeah, dude, and they, you know, down in that crew bar, man, you just get wrecked. <laughs> I'm seeing a silver so, lining here, Alex. 
So like, again, I would go, I'd do a show, I'd go downstairs and I'm not a big drinker. At least I wasn't until I took this cruise ship mm-hmm. and you had <laughs> nothing else to do. So I would just, I would do a show for 2000 people, have a blast. And then I would go downstairs and just get wrecked with all of the, like <laughs> the dancers and the singers that are in the other shows oh, yeah. that they do in the theater. And then at like three in the morning, I would waddle into bed, wake up. And... <laughs> it was like groundhog week. Right. Every week you would do like the same thing. It would be like, oh, this week I'm going to go see the Paul McCartney cover show. Oh, I'm going to go see The Magician on Tuesday. Oh, I'm going to go see – oh, we have a show on Wednesday. We got a show on Thursday. Oh, Friday we got the day off and then improv, improv. Like It was like a weird sort of like weird reset every Sunday when you would port in New York City. You'd go from being super famous and everyone on the boat knowing who you were to mm-hmm. nobody knowing who you were. And then by Tuesday after your show, you were super famous <laughs> for the rest. It was weird, dude. It was a, it's a really weird, like everybody says this after they get off the boat that they would like write a show about what it's like to be on a cruise ship. And nobody ever does it because right. I'm sure <laughs> at this point, like every single network has been pitched like 15 shows about being a comp comedian on a cruise ship. But oh, yeah. it's okay. crazy, dude. It, it, it's, I look back on it. And I, again, like, oh man, I I did not enjoy it. But now talking about it with you, I'm like, ah, I guess it wasn't that bad. (laughs) I was like, (laughs) it was still kind of fun. It was, it was crazy. I was, I was 23 years old when I did that. Wow. Yeah. Dude, what a a weird existence. It was weird, dude, but it was great. It was performing. Those shows were great. It was just everything in between that was the worst, but. Sure. That being said, man, it was it was I learned a lot about making folks on vacation, folks that are not savvy comedy goers in Los Angeles laugh. And that was it's it's a skill that nice. I that I think is really important that a lot of people don't learn. It's oh, a yeah. hard skill to learn because you ha- like getting everyday people to come watch you do your thing is hard. But sure. getting students and other comedians to come do it is not hard because they're already in the theater or they're in the building and they just go, all right, I'll sit and watch you and support you. So it's 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 a lot of – that to me is the best part about those audiences is you're making folks laugh that really are – they're a little tuned up. They've mm-hmm. had one too many margaritas by the pool and oh, yeah. they're there to laugh like they want to have fun. Right. So, just, yeah. That makes sense. I've heard a lot about like stand-up in LA specifically. It's its own sort of like – community whereas like if you want to up your game a little bit you kind of have to leave los angeles because it's it can be like i'm gonna word this wrong but like less supportive by nature if that makes sense yeah well stand up and improv are are very they're different beasts oh yeah for sure and you've done both i've i have done both i've done very little stand up i don't do a lot of it i i don't it's not my thing I, every once in a while, I, ha- I have like a, I like look off into the Twin Suns and think I'm gonna try stand up again. <laughs> You're like, and then I always go, <laughs> yeah, and I'm always like, nah, I'm not gonna do that. Um, but but it, with improv, right, is because it's built around this idea of community and yes and and working together and mm-hmm. supporting one another. It's a much more supportive community than stand up. Stand up's cutthroat, man. Oh yeah. It's like you're fighting for 5 minutes of time. For minutes, yeah. Yeah, and I'm like, "Nah, I'm good. I don't need that. I don't right. need that. Need that stress in my life." <laughs> yes and. Yeah, yes and I'm not going to do this. Yeah, fair. Fair. It's a very specific skill as well because it's uh-huh. it's less. I mean, typically from you know what I've seen is it's less character driven and a lot of times kind of less story driven and more referential and more storytelling stand up. Where I don't know, it is very very different as you said. I couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it, like 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 anything. There's so many different styles and beautiful facets of oh, yeah, stand up. Sure. There are there are some stand ups that I absolutely adore. It's just the actual the 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 act of getting involved in the stand up community does not seem like a pleasant one to me. I just I don't. I agree. It's like, nah, I'm good, man. I'm gonna, I, I'm not gonna disrespect your art form and just think that I could do it just because I think I'm funny. Right. So I. It's one of those things I don't do a lot. But improv and sketch I've done for years and years and years, and I, I still – I don't do it nearly as much, which is a big reason why I started doing the podcast with Steve was I wanted to do something that 
was not as fleeting. I call improv a really fleeting art form. Once you do it, it's gone. Mm -hmm. The the show's never saved. You never repeat it. You never do it again because you're making it up on the spot. So no matter how much you do it, the only thing you really have to show for it is the fact that you're getting better at it. That's the only thing. And a lot of people don't understand how much better you've gotten at it because they're only going to see you do it once or twice. Sure. So it, you, it's it's one of these things where you never really see your progress. So I wanted to do something where I felt like I could start cataloging just something, like something that is Fair. like, okay, this Have is funny. Have something tangible to look back on as opposed to like, exactly. this bit. I mean, you had to be there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you really you really should have gone to see my improv team, Smacks McGee, right. at, uh, <laughs> Im, at improv, at improv pow pow. <laughs> on uh, Vine, Vine Boulevard, man, we were we were really something, dude. We were really banging out those heralds. That's right. Uh, <laughs> we so, killed like, it. That Guy was a beanie. Yeah, you should have been really, there. <laughs> yeah, you should have been there, man. We were all in plaid. It looked great, yeah. dude. It looked great. It looked great. It was one of the best shows I've ever done. So, like, yeah, I, that's one of those things where I I actually really miss improv, and I should. I, I I always tell myself I need to start doing it again, but it's one of those things where it'll always be like the most important thing to me. But I feel like I'm in a good place not doing it nearly as much. But improv is that, that I, improv is how I feel like I come up with everything creatively, right? Because because of that skill that I learned at Second City and Upgrades this brigade, I have been able to create things in my life and do things myself in a way that I don't think a lot of other creatives can mm-hmm. my, my improv skill set, which is, which is important. Sure. No, that yeah. totally makes sense. Man, it's also pretty nuts when you think about it. Like you said, you studied at Second City, which is like super prestigious in that community. Like what was that like? Yeah. Uh, well, it's a it's an amazing program. It's, it's like – Seven levels of the improv to help you write. So you study improvisation as a tool to write sketch comedy. And then when you graduate, you perform a sketch comedy review. It's where I met Steve, where I do my podcast. I right. think we met in level I think we met in level three. I was twenty years old at the time. I don't know how Steve, how old Steve was. Um, we hit it off uh, in class, but we didn't really become good friends until after Second City. We ended, I actually ended up bonding over hockey. I believe hockey and Star Wars were the two things that we really bonded over. Uh-huh. But in terms of studying at Second City, the moment I took my first class, I went, I want to work for these guys. It was like that quick. Sure. Because I want to, I, I want to work for these guys. And I did every, I, I took every class I could. I was there every day. I ran lights for shows. I tore tickets at the door. I swept up at night. I did everything I could to be as involved in that community as possible. So when they had auditions for the boats, I basically went and did my thing and just really tried to show that I think I'm good enough and funny enough to do it. And it took, it took two years to book the boat. Nobody, you never book it on your first year. It's just, that's not how it works. Um, And I did everything I could to be involved with that, that building in that community. And it was, everything dude i've met i met my fiance at second city she we we were in a show together um i met i don't know if you i i don't know if you watched it but we did a live uh taping of our show at a comic book shop called called quest and that guy who's playing george lucas oh really uh, yeah him and i are he's like my best friend from second city dude yeah so a lot of folks there kiff the guy who voices um uh, old Han Solo on Forces of Destiny. Yes, him and I were in a. I was in a uh, a sketch show at Second City with his wife, and that's how Kiff and I became close. So Second City is like the weird. Roy encouraged me to go to Second City, and Second City's the thing that made it so I was a working actor wow. in Los Angeles. It was uh, everything is Second City. As soon as I signed up at Second City, I signed with my agent. I started auditioning commercially. I started booking commercials. I, I got a theatrical agent. I started booking theatrical jobs here and there. Uh, Second City taught me that I have a bit of a writer's bone to me, so I, I started writing more. I started creating my own content. It all It's all because of Second City. Second City, if anybody that moves to Los Angeles and wants to get into acting, I would tell them to take an improv class. Even if you don't want to be a comedic actor, take an improv class. It's a good. It's a good skill set to learn. For no matter what you're auditioning for, sure, man. What was yeah. what was one of the biggest things that you learned there that like upped your game? The biggest thing that I learned at Second City that upped my game was 
Mm, that's that's an amazing question. That's a great question. I try. I would. S- I, <laughs> I would say, dude, really great question, man. Great. You know what? I'm thank thank you. Thank really you. I'm bowing. Question. I'm He's bowing. Also, well amazing. done repeating the question back in the answer. Someone yeah, yeah, yeah. knows how this game is played. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, the, the most important thing I learned at Second City that upped my game. I would say there's a couple. Always. Uh, the biggest one would be trust your instincts. Ooh. So trust that little feeling that's making you tick in that moment that's making whatever it is you're what you're doing at that moment work. So like what is it about that scene that works? Trust that. You can feel it. You know when it's clicking. You know when what you're doing is right. So trust that trust that instinct. You hear the response from the audience. You feel the rhythm with your partner. While you're improvising, you can feel that what you're doing is working. Trust that instinct. I think that was that was a big one. And I think for me, too, a a big one was just recognizing as quickly as possible. What about what you're talking about or what you're doing is funny Mm -hmm. and building upon it with somebody. So that would be like the biggest skill I think you could ever learn when auditioning for like commercials. Because when you audition for a commercial, you the ninety nine percent of the time, man, they hand you the worst script <laughs> you've ever read. I mean, you've watched a commercial; they're all so bad. I mean, they hand you straight up bad scripts, oh, yeah. and they will just say every time, "Hey, hey, 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 oh, that was great. Let's get one just as is. Great. Now that you do that, do me a favor. I just make this make this your own." And basically, that's code for. Make this funny because we don't know what we're doing, and we <laughs> we called we called comedians in here to make to make our commercial funnier. It's just what it means. It's straight up what it means. And you go, all right, you do your thing, you make it way funnier, and then you get a callback, and you probably book it. Like mm-hmm. it's always, it, and, and that is that is what you'll learn from an improv class. And if you, you know, it's everybody will always ask, like, can you teach somebody to be funny? And I don't think you can teach somebody to have a funny point of view, Mm -hmm. but you can teach somebody the skills to recognize what's funny in an improv scene. So I don't like, I don't know if I could say like, Oh, you'll go to second city and you will be funny. After you take that, I would say you will go to second city and you will understand what makes something funny. But I don't know if you'll be able to make something funny. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I remember I auditioned for this one commercial and I just had to say, es muy grande. And I was like, yeah. I'm, I'm never going to book this. <laughs> it was so weird. Did I was you, like, did so, you book it? Oh, of course not. I was a guy named oh. Ken at like Office Max. I was like, what is, what is <laughs> happening? So what, what's, what's the weirdest commercial audition you've had? The weirdest commercial audition I've had? Oh, oh yeah, my we're diving. God. We're diving, Alex. Dude, I, I mean, honestly, man, <laughs> there's probably so many of them. Good. I'm trying to think of a really good – oh, here's a good one. Here's a good one. I'll, I'll give you this. I, I'll give you – not weirdest. I'll give you the one that I left it, and I was just like so proud of myself for doing this. <laughs> also, don't, don't do this if you're – don't do this if you're like just becoming – do this when you've booked a couple jobs and you've got some <laughs> – You've got some cojones. I'm so into uh, this. So I auditioned for a Pop Secret commercial. Oh, nice. And it was a callback for – it was a callback. So and usually the callbacks are in Santa Monica, which is a long drive if you're coming from Burbank. And they are always in Santa Monica because the ad agencies usually fly in from New York or wherever they're located. Mm-hmm. And they're right by LAX. So they can fly right. in for the day and they don't have to deal with LA traffic and they can go right back. So normally it's the actors that have to do the long – horrible drive through traffic for that callback which you know whatever that's part of the job that's right and i went to this pop secret callback and it was like a kid who was like he was giving a presentation and it didn't like it wasn't going well and then 
he like popped some pop secret into his mouth, like flipped <laughs> up a kernel, and suddenly he was giving like the greatest presentation ever. It was so stupid. I love it was it. such a stupid commercial. <laughs> and I did it and like I wasn't clicking with the material. I was like, this isn't this isn't me. I'm this isn't this isn't clicking. I'm not gonna book this. And the director said, Wow, you really don't care about your work at all, do you? <laughs> Like straight up, just like you really don't care about your work at all. Now, this could be one of two things. He could be trying to elicit a response from me because he's trying to get me to feel like the guy who's failing his presentation. Oh, he could deep, be doing that. Deep. I don't, th- I don't think that's what he's doing. No. <laughs> I think what he's doing is he's being an asshole right. and he's saying, wow, you really aren't trying and you're not doing a good job. Right. And mind you, I am 20 years old at the time, right? Oh, boy. And I – but but – I will say this, and this is this is, I guess, a humble brag. By mm-hmm. that point, I had probably booked by tw- I, in my first year, I booked seven commercials. Wow! This was probably my second year, so I was probably on like fifteen or sixteen Dude. at this point. I, I was, I mean, that's how I make my living as a commercial actor. Killing it. And I was at this job, and by that point, I had worked enough to where I wasn't going to be pushed around. Mm-hmm. And he said that really shitty comment to me, and I remember I looked at him. This is a 20 year old kid. This guy's probably like 40 years old. And oh I went, boy. I went, it's a popcorn cur- commercial. <laughs> and he, what? <laughs> I went, it's a popcorn commercial. And wait, one more time. He went, what? And I went, settle the fuck down, Polanski. It's a popcorn <laughs> oh, commercial. No. And he looked at the ad agency and the ad agency was kind of <gasps> like, holy shit, Dude. this kid has such balls. And I was like, I think I'm done here. And I walked out the door when Dude. he said, I. And I, I was just like, whatever. And that 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 cast director still calls me in to oh, this really? day. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because they were like, I was like, first of all, don't talk to me like that. Yeah. Don't talk to me like that. I'm the one who drove down here. You're the one. You're getting paid to be here. I'm not. I'm basically having a job interview. I've been in here for one minute and you've made me wait for an hour to come in for this one minute. And the first thing you tell me is, is I don't care about what I'm doing. Oh, boy. like that. Like I care about this more than you will ever understand clearly. Right. So now that that's out of the way, you're directing a popcorn commercial. <laughs> so you may care about it a little bit less. And that, that moment, wow. <laughs> Once I got into my car, I just burst into tears. I was so upset. I was like, ah, I hate that guy. How could that guy say that to me? You know what I mean? I of freaked course. out. My dad, I was like, this guy was such a jerk. Told my dad what he said, what I said. And he was like, buddy, you can't do that. I was like, you're right. You're right, you're right. And I like chilled out. I, mean, I, I don't do that. Actually, I don't think I've ever done it since. Now I just kind of <laughs> roll my eyes and I go, yeah, have a nice day. If they're rude like that. Right. But it was that that totally was like the the definitely one of those ones where I was like, oof, that was like a nightmare bad sure. audition. And and for pop secret of all things, for, <laughs> for it's always secret. the little ones that get you, man. That's but so yeah, co- commercial acting is a is a weird thing because it's not it's not the most creatively fulfilling work as an actor, but it pays the bills, so you can't oh, complain yeah, for sure. And I, I, I mean, this was all pre Second City cruise ship, and I remember I was like, "Oh, I'm gonna book this boat. I'm gonna leave." I worked a lot commercially. I, I left and did the boats for Second City. Came back, and I was doing. I ended. I, I did a lot more commercials when I got back, and I booked a lot of um, ones that I was maybe more proud of when I got back from second city, they started to get more fun. Mm -hmm. Um, just doing stuff for companies that I thought was pretty cool. Um, but just like what, what started kind of happening with improv and everything else is was, it was starting to get stale and stagnant. Mm -hmm. And I, I just took those improv skills that I was using and I started writing and I started writing pilots and started pitching television shows and, making my own stuff and that that I would say that this is like the biggest transition for me as an actor is when I decided to stop just being an actor and be somebody that makes stuff yeah yeah that to me is it's a huge step that people don't take enough and that was the biggest step for me is when I decided I'm no longer going to get be given permission to do what I love right. I'm just going I'm going to do it myself and I just started 
making videos and making content, writing pilots. I did this thing called Shark Bites, which I know oh, Steve talked we're a little there. Yeah, Steve <laughs> talked about that on your show, and that was like that was sort of my first foyer into sort of making my own thing. And I think that, much like Second City, I would say is a huge part of what makes me tick as a creative and doing things that make me happy. Now is much more about doing my own thing than just like being in another product and selling hot pockets. You know what I mean? <laughs> sure. I mean, yeah. that's the big thing about like, uh, with that, with acting specifically, it's a job you have to, like you said, get permission to do, you know what yep. I mean? So it, it is only natural, especially nowadays with the way, like the access we have to technology to create our own things. It's almost yep. like a disservice to not cast yourself in things to be casted in other things. And it's a, what a time to be alive. Uh, a, a, right now, actors and creatives have all the power. For sure, they've, they, they've, 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 they might not have all the money, but they do have all the power in the world to make their own stuff. And there really is no excuse. There's Agreed. no excuse. Agreed. You know? Yeah. I know you've you've done ads for. Uh, I know you've done Nike. I know you've done GameStop. I know you've even done Apple, which those three Apple. are insane. Is there any difference in the audition for the level of brand, like from Pop Secret oh, to Apple? Uh, oh, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Like Apple, you have no idea what product you're auditioning for. You don't even really? know it's Apple. They're one of the only companies that uses code names. Wow. So I didn't. I only knew it was Apple because I got pinned. Which pinned is like you have audition, mm -hmm. then you have callback, then you have pinned or avail. One of those two words. Mm -hmm. And that basically is like, hey, we really like you. You're one of two choices. Make sure you're available these days because you're probably going to book it. So when you get pinned for Apple, that's when they tell you, hey, by the way, this is an Apple commercial. But Apple was like they they booked 40 people. Wow. They booked 40 people and they just put us in a room and had us like hang out and party and pretend to party. And like the photographer and the cameraman just walked around and shot pictures and filmed us. And we did it in like three locations over the weekend. Mm -hmm. No idea what product it's for. Wow. No idea what, no idea what they were making. If it was a commercial, if it was something else, no idea. And you don't even know if you're going to get paid as such, right? As right now, you're just being paid a day rate and right. you'll find out what you're making. So it wasn't until Apple called me in to do uh, spec spots, which are basically like they make fake commercials to show them to the company that makes Apple's commercials, a company called Chiat Day Media. They uh, called me in to make a commercial for the MacBook Air before the MacBook Air had even come out. Yeah. So I had to like sign an NDA, like fingerprint the whole thing. I went in and I did these like little commercial like fake commercials they were just trying and practicing stuff and when i was there the guy was like i have a feeling you're going to be in a really good mood in about two weeks <laughs> and i was like oh okay and it was somebody was watching american idol and I, my phone just blew up Ooh. and they were like they were like dude you're in the you're in the iphone commercial Ooh. the new i the, 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 for the for the first iphone dude they're like, dude, it wasn't the one. You know, they had that one where all the movies were going, hello, 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 hello. That was oh, yeah. like the first. Wasn't that one. It was, do you remember like, it would go, this is an iPhone. And it would oh, go, yeah. bing, ding, da, ding, 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 ding. And like the finger would come in and they would like use it and like open the internet and then open music and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. So tech, all of that stuff, if you look at all of the pictures and the social media stuff, those are my faces. That's like me. I love I'm it. all I'm all over that iPhone in the first the first year year and change of Apple iPhone and iPod touch. I technically was the face. My images were all over the phones in the Apple store. What? Yeah. So that was a that was a cool gig because I'm a, I'm a huge I'm an Apple nut too. <laughs> I'm an app, at, the, at the time I was an Apple maniac. So when I booked that, it was like it was like winning an Oscar. Yeah, for a commercial, I, I was like, booking an Apple commercial is rad. But yeah, the difference between like Apple and Pop Secret is like, <laughs> they're not even in the same league. Like you can go in and I could take a picture like, hey, here's the picture of the Pop Secret script. They don't care. Who, who's going to come? Orville Redenbacher is going to steal their <laughs> right. idea. Right. So it's like, it's, there's not really, they're not really cutting edge popcorn technology that they need to keep hidden. Sure. Um, 
but yeah, no, I did. Nike was a fun one. Uh, GameStop were probably my favorite just because I think in total I did like 10 of them. Crazy. I had a bunch. I did a ton of different ones. GameStop was was cool. And two, it was I've, I've been a spokesman. That was my that was my second time being a spokesman. So it was fun to be like the head of the campaign. So, yeah, GameStop sure. was cool. Yeah. Dude. There's a lot of them, dude. Yeah. A I lot mean, of them. And it's so great that, like, the caliber in which the, the, the campaigns that you've been in. I mean, I might have heard of Apple, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's weird because, like, I, you know, I know Steve mentioned it a little bit on your show. Like, a lot of people, when they see me, especially people that watch our podcast, have no idea. They're like, no idea that they've probably seen me. And an ad that they've been like, oh, my God, I hate this commercial. You know what I mean? <laughs> they have no idea how many times they've probably been like, oh, that kid is so annoying. <laughs> but it's me. It's just me selling you hot pocket. Hey. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Hey, it's me. Sorry about that. Something I, to fast forward through on your DVR. That's right. I, I don't remember what the ad was for. There's the one where uh, it was about different lunches. It was like a light lunch or like a heavy lunch and you fall through the floor. Uh, that was for Arby's. Arby's. That's what it was. That was great. <laughs> yeah, that was my that was my first time doing stunt work. That's it. You got the stunt bump. Yeah. Oh yeah, I got that stunt <laughs> bump. Thing. That was a real trap door. I fell through the floor. Really? Yeah, that was a real trap door. Yep. How cool it's is like, that? It's a digital effect that has me disappear, but uh-huh. I am falling through the floor and just landing on like this big pad. And it was my first time doing stunt work for that commercial. And like, the best part about it is, is I had no idea you could say like, okay, my back hurts now. <laughs> <laughs> like they would have just kept going until finally I was like, Hey, can we get like a break? My back really hurts. And the stunt guy was like, dude, you have to say something. They're like, they're, like, they're going to keep doing this. I'm like, Oh yeah, I need a break. And they're like, oh, okay, cool. Here's your break. Yeah. That was like, <laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> that was one of those ones where no idea, but I just for two straight hours falling through a trap door, I was like, ow. <laughs> Ow. Ow. I'm fine. They're, like, they're like this kid's a they're like this kid's a beast right? yeah. this badass over here it's a monster i'm like no idea just like ah, uh, gotta ice my back when i get home right. yeah that was Keep a fun one <laughs> arby's was cool i've done a lot of like fun commercials i've got to have some some definitely some fun like there's a dairy queen one where i like crash a race car through a window and like do donuts and do all this crazy stuff like i've done a lot of bizarro commercials it's sure. it's it's, in, it's interesting it's fun it pays the bills but it's Fair. still still selling products my friend You're that is products. that is true is there a key to auditioning for an ad versus yeah, auditioning for other things don't want it don't care go in you don't need the job trust Isn't that me. weird how that works play hard to get my friend you yeah, just like too, you, you, you you're just to. too busy for them. Yeah, it's like you have to find that line where it's like I don't care, so it's like whatever. So you act like you don't need them. So like, oh, he has something that maybe we need because he doesn't need us. But also, you have to kind of care a little bit. Otherwise, it's like you don't care about your work, and you get it's so it's such a weird line. Dude, chill. it's super weird. It's that's, super that's weird. Why it's but that is healthy. Like <laughs> the people that go in are not typically mentally healthy. Uh, a lot of the times oh yeah it, it is a it is a totally bizarre it's just a bizarre career it's it just a bizarre weird you're begging to work you, yet nobody wants you to work and then when you get it you're so excited but then you're like miserable when it's over and then you have horrible imposter syndrome it's just yeah, <laughs> dude it, it's awful so i gotta make which, sure you're doing cool stuff in the meantime which like which is one of these things like to tie it into maybe a, I'm sure you've t- I don't know how much you talk about Star Wars on the show. I'm sure you do quite a bit, uh, quite a bit. But, you know, that's one of these things where why the Kelly Marie Tran stuff was just so infuriating to me. Oh, yes. Because, you know, obviously it's infuriating for the the the, the racism reasons and the sexism reasons. But Absolutely. just, you know, obviously I'm, I'm a white male living in Los Angeles, California. My, my privilege is plenty. I'm very aware of <laughs> I'm I'm aware of my privilege, but right. like it, you know, I, I'll never be able to truly relate to a person of color's struggle unless I have empathy and do my best to understand it. Absolutely. And my my way of looking at that Kelly Marie Tran for me was never about that she got chased off social media. Mm-hmm. Was never about that people said horrible things to her. For me, it was, wow, we all ruined this thing 
that she worked so hard to accomplish. Yep. Like agreed. It has the fact that I can't even imagine how it would feel to get to act in a star Wars movie I know. and be a lead and have an action figure made out of you right. and be one of the central characters in that story and fly a spaceship and shoot a blaster and see right. Chewbacca and oh, like yeah. all and, of it and, and, and be on the shoot a scene on the millennium Falcon to have it be so bad that it outweighs that. Agreed. That's where I went, man, something's wrong here. We got a real problem. We got a real problem here. And I will continue to do my best to try to have empathy in a very polarized, polarizing and strange time in fandom. But yeah. yeah, that was, that, that was a that, that, it's it's interesting how everybody relates to those things in a different kind of way and for me it was just it was rem- it's remembering all these miserable auditions and these these you know things you didn't get that you desperately wanted or things that you you did get that ter- didn't turn out as great as you thought they were going to turn out oh, yes. and just knowing what it would mean to book something like that and then have the experience be forever tainted with this bizarre, just like entitled behavior to me is just, is, is the worst part about that. I agree. Yeah. I totally yeah. agree. It's crazy. And then to think like for, for something like that, I mean, you're auditioning for like months and months and months and brought it back and then again, and then brought back. And it's like, there's so much that you have to go through and do over and over and over before you even get to day one. It's so nuts. Oh, so oh nuts. I mean, they don't even understand yeah, I know. <laughs> what like the people that are like, you're an idiot. Like you ruined star Wars. Like they don't even understand. They genuinely don't understand how many other people with infinitely more control and decision-making powers had everything to do with what happened in that movie that she had nothing to do with. Nothing to do with. Absolutely. Like, they, they just don't even get it. They think that Ryan Johnson showed up with a camera in his hand, and th- they think that the lasers just came out of the prop. Like, they, <laughs> they, like no concept for the hundreds of blue-collar workers that work on these movies, the people that whose job it is solely to make sure that the director is fed. Right. Because – if he's not fed, he's going to work for 17 hours straight. Yep. Like they, it, and it's just, uh, it, uh, 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 I'm not, <laughs> I don't, not going to, I don't want to, I don't want to get, you can I'm tune into you. black series rebels for rage. That's about right. Star Wars. <laughs> well, actually it's not really, we don't really rage on star Wars, but tune in. If you want, if you want to hear me go ahead and do that, or you can, you can tune in there. I'm with you. Uh, that's, that's yeah. been kind of the whole idea of me, my show specifically. It's like giving a microphone to people that wouldn't normally have it and hearing the yeah. stories about behind the scenes. Like I'm obsessed with creatures. Like that's one of my favorite things about star Wars is the aliens and the creatures and all that. So I've had so many creature performers on here and some I'm like really good friends with now. And yeah. it's so cool to see like, Oh yeah, that alien that you really like. Well, here's the guy inside of it. And these yeah. are the names of the six people that are like ones in his ear telling him where to walk. One person's doing the mechanical eyes. One's doing just the lips. And then one person makes sure the fans are working. Like the depth that goes into these things, the amount of work is bonkers. Yeah, bonkers. totally. The average totally. person doesn't know. The average person yep. doesn't know. And yeah. like he said, how awful auditioning can be. And then uh, that's why I like what you said. After auditioning, after a while, you're like, dude, I'm going to make my own thing. And I yeah. cannot believe one of the first things you made was Shark Bites. <laughs> because, it is the first thing I ever made. Dude, I've – okay, so full disclosure, I've seen the pilot. And I've also <laughs> seen the animated pilot. And oh, did you find the animated pilot? I did. I did. And dude, I dug them both a lot. I, maybe Holy crap. I, maybe because I love puppets. I really like puppets a lot. I'm a huge Muppets fan. And I have a puppet of my own. To like, I'm actually uh, Mike Quinn, who is 9-num. He yeah. has an online puppetry school that I go to. Oh, so cool. So I'm like, dude, I'm into puppets. And then I was like, Shark Bites, what is this? Because Steve told me about it. And I was like, I'm going to look into this. Sounds great. And then I saw it, and I was like, dude, it's puppets. So <laughs> I have a lot of questions about shark bites. First off, where'd the idea come from? Talk to well, me. Well, it, it came from living with Roy. 
Oh, really? Is he? Oh, that's all it is. You, when you said you would call each other by different names, that bit when you're like, Kevin, he's like, my name's not even Kevin. Is that from that? Mm-hmm. Uh, no, that was more of like, I was yelling for my old roommate, Kevin. Right, right, right. But, right. <laughs> but uh, a lot of that stuff with like, like the moment when he like moved in is like, where are the chips? Where's the yeah. salsa? Like <laughs> little things in. like that. <laughs> yeah. He's like already in, uh, you know, t- full disclosure. I actually, I was not a big puppet guy. Really? Puppets. So why puppets? The, because to accomplish the idea, it was the most cost effective way. Wow. Right. Like the idea was me living with a shark roommate, never <laughs> me living with a shark puppet. So it's what, so the, sort of the the original incarnation of the idea, the original pitch basically was like that one dude and his shark roommate. I lived in a little loft in Silver Lake or whatever, and I had a roommate that was a little shark, and <laughs> we would call like the – if you were doing the elevator pitch to somebody in a – like uh, say you're, you're, you happen to be on the Disney lot. There's an executive there. They ask you what you're working on. You say, oh, yeah, imagine if like Calvin and Hobbes grew up, moved to Silver Lake. That... <laughs> That's like the pitch of the show. I'm into it. And that that was sort of the idea. But we never really wanted to like make it like the Muppets or people that already do puppets so incredibly. So that's why the puppets are very like they almost feel like toys that came to life. Right. Um, they feel like plushy animals, like plush toys. Not they as do. much. Yeah, not as yeah, much. They're like... definitely not Muppets. They're a specific no, type of not. puppet. It is. I mean, they really are like it's, and that's a that's a testament to Cody, the guy that did all of our that did all of my puppet designs, and I would basically send him the character that we needed to have made, and then he would make it by hand. Really? For the yeah, he was like, he was my Cody is like was like the Steve Cody and this guy Neil. They were like the Steves for Shark Bites. Like they were my the two guys that I made that stuff with. Right. And um. Basically, the original idea was this guy who lives with a shark roommate. And what we were going to do is we were going to do three panel comic strips, like what you would get like for Peanuts or Calvin and Hobbes or for Garfield. And then what we would do is we would have Cody draw the comic strip and then we would film it as a vine with the puppet. Oh, nice. So that that was the original idea. But what we soon found out was comic book, like comic strip humor does not work in a video format. Because comic strips are very much like a chuckle. They're not a laugh out loud. Agreed. So when you're when you're watching it as a video, you kind of go, huh. And that's not – it's not the response right. you want when you're watching <laughs> a video. So the original idea was that. Then it slowly turned into, all right, how about this? What if it's a graphic novel that we write a pilot script for? And that'll be the thing because we took that we took a meeting at this company called Mosaic after we had made all we did. We made one video that was like, hey, guys, I'm Spielberg. Thanks for liking Shark Bites on Facebook. That was like the only thing we had right. was this like weird like, hey, thanks for checking out face. Check, thanks for checking out Shark Bites. We hadn't made a pilot. We hadn't written a pilot. We hadn't done anything. We had just done all these like two minute YouTube videos that we were starting to make. And. Uh, this company called Mosaic, which is Will Ferrell and Judd Apatow's production company, a uh, development executive saw it there and was like, hey, I want you guys to come in. This looks really interesting. And we were like, oh, OK. So we went in. We had like no pitch. We just kind of were like, yeah, we just started doing this thing. And the guy said, well, it's really interesting. He said, you can go one of two ways. You can write a pilot and you can shop your script for two years or – you can just go buy a camera and you can make it yourself. And if somebody likes it, maybe they'll buy it. And I instantly went, well, I'd rather do that. I'd rather make something than just write something. Oh, yeah. So I wrote a script in two weeks, two wow. weeks, banged it out, two weeks. Killed then, it. Then, two, then I think a month later, we shot it. We shot a 22-minute pilot on our own, our own. We spent all the money. We called all our film school buddies. I've called all my buddies from second city we scrounged together the best possible thing we can and we made this thing and at the time we had a good friend that was working at dreamworks and uh, a lot of like companies in los angeles they'll have these 
like screening rooms that you that they watch like dailies on or they watch like a rough cut on Mm -hmm. and then cool cooler companies like a company like dreamworks or disney on like a friday night they'll let their employees rent it out and maybe show a project they're working on or show like so people can come watch it in a cool theater and they don't have to like rent out this big thing so this guy was like yeah dude you can come show your pilot at at uh dreamworks and really yeah, so we basically had the big premiere at DreamWorks, and we just went ham, dude. We made <laughs> people like feel like it was going to be the biggest thing ever. There were posters up at DreamWorks. Dude. We had like I had custom Pabst Blue Ribbons cans made yes. with like a little shark fin that was like in the Pabst logo oh that God. said like Shark Bites Brew, and we had like the puppets and acrylic cases and like had a banner. We made it look like a dude. legit premiere and everybody's like what the like they're like what the fuck is this yeah like who are these 25 year old kids just like banging out they were like dude this is this is crazy yeah i'm I'm even i'm falling into my california draw with all my likes talking about shark i'm into Uh, it (laughs) and we screened this thing and a lit agent was there saw it and just said I, 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 I can sell this. We have, we have to sell this. Wow. So in two weeks I had pit, we had pitched it everywhere. I pitched Netflix, Hulu, HBO, uh, Microsoft at the time was getting into content, cartoon network, cart, uh, MTV, comedy central, Nickelodeon, this place called hub, which you don't know if you remember hub, but it's the Hasbro network. Oh yeah. That has- transformers and my little pony oh yeah and here's the crazy thing dude we knew we would never sell it there so we went in we had a good time because we didn't care right. we knew that we would never buy it that woman ended up leaving hub and started working at disney xd called us in and basically they blind bought the show what to make that animated pilot so what? we had to re- we had to reverse engineer the show into an anime thing now mind you this is like over the span of three years yeah of course this, this <laughs> yeah. wasn't none like of this happens made a fast. Pilot. <laughs> yeah yeah made a pilot and then three weeks later is working at disney no man it was like insanely hard work insanely hard work and then after three years of grinding we we sold uh we got a development deal at disney and then for a year we were in development. It was still to this day, I consider it both the most challenging and amazing thing I've ever done working for that company in that capacity, trying to make a show. You know, unfortunately, the show did not get picked up. We got to the final round. It was down to us and two other shows mm-hmm. that they were going to produce. And they went with a reboot of DuckTales. Ah, OK, fair. And they <laughs> went with a show called uh, Billy Dilly or Dilly Billy or something like that. Never it was, heard uh, of it. <laughs> and they did that show Milo something or other, like the Phineas and Ferb guys new show. Ah, they right, right. That show, which how are three kids that have never done anything going to compete with the guy that created SpongeBob DuckTales Fair. and, <laughs> and the guy who created Phineas and Ferb, like, and that was full disclosure. Also the most heartbreaking thing that, I've ever been through. Oh, I can imagine getting that close, getting that close, getting that close to creating something and then having it slip through your hands and Mm -hmm. having it have nothing to do with the quality of your content, knowing that you beat out the other 17 shows, but you just weren't quite like famous enough or established or whatever was really hard for us Fair. it was really hard and it was it was it took a long time to build up that creative energy and start putting it back into something else but i mean starting the fact that the first script i ever wrote i sold to disney yeah. will always <laughs> be like a weird little like check mark in the box of what the fucks of yeah, alex Bax's life real not not the one that's been arrested. Right, uh, yeah. this- <laughs> Actually, how do we know? <laughs> I've never been arrested. Sorry to let everybody down. There's I have still never time. been arrested. There's still time, Alex. I believe <laughs> in you. <laughs> yeah, man. You could do it. But yeah, dude, that was like – and that show I'm so proud of because what you see in that pilot – because there might be folks that go watch that. They and should. I watch that pilot, and there are 
moments that I cringe when I watch that <laughs> pilot because I'm just like, yikes. Like, ooh, that joke is like off color or knowing what the intention of the joke was because the whole idea – I really – in all of my work and the things I work on now, not necessarily with Black Series Rebels because that's a Star Wars podcast but or sure. a talk show. Mm-hmm. All of the, the theme that I really like playing with and will always be the most interesting thing to me is like what does it mean to grow up? How does nostalgia play a role in the way we define ourselves as humans? How how do how do these things connect us as individuals? Why are why are these things so important to us? And that's really what Shark Bites was all about. Mm-hmm. It was about three guys in those in between years that are gonna learn what it means to be adults, but they're gonna procrastinate along the way. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that to me has always been such an interesting theme. That is tackled a lot, but it's never really like it's explored in a lot of coming of age stories, but very rarely do you hear about like 25 year olds that are struggling. True. Very true. You hear about you hear about 18 year olds and then you hear about midlifers that are struggling. You very rarely hear about the millennial that's outside of college that can't find a job. Right. Or or the one that really desperately wants to be a graphic designer that just can't get work. Yeah. Or wants to be a photographer and can't book work or, you know, wants to be an engineer, but all the companies still have all these lifers working there and they can't quite become the engineer that they wanted to be. I think it's a really interesting part of life that we don't we don't talk about a lot. And that's what Shark Bites was going to be about. It was really going to be about that that time where you learn that, you know, saying some stuff isn't cool. <laughs> behaving certain ways isn't cool and that's why like when i watch that pilot there are some moments that make me cringe because like spielberg will make jokes about being gay now i don't obviously i would never intentionally mock a person who is a homosexual sure but the character spielberg and the character of alex in this show would do that so that they can learn not to do it later right Right. You see what I'm saying? So Absolutely. we started we started planting these weird seeds that like in like so when I watch that pilot I go, "Oh man, if nobody knows what the intention of this right. show <laughs> is going to be like, oh boy, what is the point of this?" That was always the intention was learning learning things that you that are very difficult things to learn sure. and learning that in these sort of funny kind of weird quirky ways. So that was always sort of the theme of that show, but Basically, after Disney passed, man, we just now it's kind of this beautiful little thing that kind of exists on YouTube that some people watch that I get people right. Like, what is this? Why isn't there more of this? And I'm like, oh, man, sorry, man. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I Talk agree to... with those people. <laughs> uh, I don't. Yeah, I mean, that, thank you, dude. That really that means a lot to me. I'm actually looking at the puppets right now. They will always be sort of majestically standing yes. in my office. Dude, um, and it. you know what? One day they will they will come back, and I will do something with them again. Um, yes, uh, we're, we're I'm working with those guys on a, a lot of new stuff, a lot of really cool things. Um, you know, Black Series Rebels has a lot of cool stuff coming. Black Series Rebels is is the thing I do for fun, mm-hmm. but I've got a lot of uh, my my dream is to make content that people love whatever it is if it's a, if it's a Star Wars podcast great if it's a if it's a web series about a shark <laughs> it's, if it's any other number of infinite ideas i've written down in a notebook great i just i i care about making myself happy creatively right and 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 giving people a sense that they're a part of something cool in community and that like that I think w- what I learned from shark bites has really bled into black series rebels like that right and it's something that steve has really helped foster and it's this idea that if you're just cool and excellent to each other and treat people with dignity and respect 
And it doesn't mean you can't take a joke. It doesn't mean that you can't have snark and have fun and be silly and mock. Of course. But everybody knows the difference between a joke that's intended to make somebody laugh but not harm and a joke that's intended to cause like harm to someone's well-being and absolutely that that to me is something that is important to me that black series rebels continues to have from my experience of creating my own stuff and you know i'm i'm also really really humbled with how much the star wars community has embraced our show yeah and and knowing that at any given time if probably i said like Hey yo, here's this thing I made. I would probably get everybody would be like, "Oh my gosh!" But you know, you know what I mean. I haven't found that like that thing yet that I'm ready to share sure. with be like that. And it will happen. There will, I'm sure there will be a movie or a TV pilot at some point that I write or make that I want everybody to to check out. And but yeah, man, I'm just I'll watch it. You know that. Man, I watch Shark Bites so. <laughs> hey man if you can sit through that i uh, i mean that being said i will say this the animated pilot i think is awesome it's uh, great what a chain live chain breaker or something what was it called chain, chain, snapper, bro. chain snapper chain snapper dude the the song in that the the i'm at the pizza hut i was singing that all day today oh yeah it's I'm so at the, good at the taco bell yeah when we when we when we pitch that to disney like when we because the way you pitch an an, an animated show is you actually like you you read the lines as you click through the storyboard so it's like me and my creators like doing all the voices and like doing this thing and when we did that part we dragged it out for like three minutes (laughs) we just sang it like danced and like i mean we're dude i'm in front of the vice president of development at disney and he was like these kids are he's like this guy's nuts <laughs> it was <laughs> awesome yeah that's Dude. up by a band called it's by a band called das racist uh. and i and i think uh <laughs> i think that version of it, it that that version of it is the wallpaper remix so if oh you look up God. wallpaper combination pizza hut and taco bell it'll come up on youtube um that's so funny yeah. I do. <laughs> How much control do you have in a de- in development with like somebody like Disney? How much input do you get to have in it? Because it's your baby, but they're developing it. I mean, you get to have a-, a lot of input. I mean, it's still your idea. They're gonna tell you if they don't think you're doing something right. Mm-hmm. And I would say what we learned is there were probably moments where we probably should have had more of a spine sure. to to stick up for ideas. Um, but you, we, we've, I, I mean, I felt like we were able to do our vision and create what we wanted to create. Now I would say the reason why shark bites didn't go besides the obvious, like there were more famous people making shows that they went with. Uh I would say the big thing was is because the original idea for the show is like a children's, a children's thing that grew up with its audience. Mm -hmm. So like it's intended for 25 year olds. Right. And when you reverse engineer it to then be for 11 year olds, it's now just another kid's show. Sure. So it loses a little bit of that, like that, that edge. charm and that, that <laughs> e- edge is that's so funny that you say edge <laughs> because like, I all like Cody, the guy that designs all our pins that I did shark bites with, uh-huh. he like, he'll be like, Oh yeah, make it edgier because that's like, <laughs> it would make us so mad. Yeah. We'd be like, Dude, every time we make it edgy, they'd be like, Oh, tone it down. So like, <laughs> I would say it's less like edgy and more it it, lo- it loses some of its like irony uh yes like i believe when that it, when it it loses that irony that that quality that the audience is going oh my gosh it's like this is giving me those feels of what it was like to watch a nicktoon but like i oh, relate yeah. to it i think that is that to me was what made shark bites one of the one of the special things about it so when you reverse engineer it to be a kid's show it's no longer irony and now it's just a a a teenage boy and a shark going on adventures which sounds like every other talking animal kids show sure so but that being said that pilot that animated pilot was rock star it It was was rock star i feel feel good about that i still my favorite bit in it is the when he sees the tacos and then the mariachi guy like just (laughs) Oh. Out that, yeah yeah oh my god Belts out that massive number is still make and you the that's one of those like oh that came after 
the Disney pitch. We came up with that oh, really? <laughs> paper when we were putting the animatic together. And I was like, dude, wouldn't it be really funny if like right here, just like a mariachi dude, just like belted out like a six second, like high note. <laughs> We all we put it in there. We looked on YouTube. We I, I think we looked on YouTube. The greatest mariachi singer in the world, and that oh. was the first <laughs> that was the first video that came up. And I was like, yeah, that's it. And we put it in, and it still still kills me. I I think it that might be on maybe it's on my website. The animated it pilot. Is. If anybody goes to look for it, look for the animated pilot. Don't watch the puppet one. Well, watch both. Watch them both. They're, They're both great. <laughs> How did you shoot the puppet one? Because you're there, and the puppets are there as well. Like, is there a guy underneath with his hand in a puppet and, like, an arm rod? Or how was oh, that it, done? It, it's, it's, it's like you would do any puppet thing. So, like, everything's raised up. There's two guys down there controlling it. They got hand and rods. It was two improvisers from Second City, Keith Ray and Tilt Tyree, good friends of mine that had taken puppetry classes. Um, we had a puppet captain. We had a bunch of different puppeteers that came and did all the different characters. Wow. And then we shot it. We shot it like you would anything. It was a multi-cam setup. We had there there are like forty people behind that camera that you obviously can't see yeah. that are doing all the jobs that you would need someone to do on set. Um, yeah, no, we did it. We did it traditional with with monitors. Yeah, like the puppets, sweet the monitors. Like yeah, dude, we did the whole thing. Puppets are a nightmare to work with. <laughs> they're, they're, they are. They're divas. They're, I don't know if you dude, do that. They're awful. And Brooklyn seemed like he just would be terrible with background. Oh, Brooklyn. It's so funny <laughs> because like when I when I think about the characters like Spielberg is who I always wish that I could be that I never <laughs> am. that's who that character is to me. Brooklyn is probably more like who I am <laughs> than I want to be. And then me, Alex, is probably just pretty close to what I am. But yeah, Brooklyn. Did you watch any of Brooklyn's video vlogs? No, there's video vlog. What? Of Brooklyn? Dude, how did on. I miss let me, these? I'm gonna go to YouTube right now. You're definitely gonna have to link me, because Brooklyn's my see. favorite. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, shark bites. Let's see if it comes up here. No, it's so buried now because we went to shark bites pu- puppet. Maybe. Here we go. Let's see. You didn't? Did you see where we remade the like? Did you see where we remade the 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 famous monologue from Jaws? No. Oh my god, How did dude! I there not are not get in these. Oh my gosh, yeah, dude. There are. Let me see how many videos there are. Let's just see. There are. I'm oh, so excited right now. Like at least fifty videos. Oh my more god. Of that stuff. Yeah, That's dude. Amazing. And, then, and it's all like really weird stuff <laughs> that we. Dude. Some of it's like weird ads and stuff for like events we were doing, but yeah, man, like. If you look up Brooklyn's video vlog, he would review movies. Oh my! Because this is when vlogs were like super popular. Oh yeah. So there, there's one where he does Avengers that to me is like, <laughs> oof. Oops. He reviews the. Then that shows you how old this is. Six right. years ago, he reviews. He <laughs> stupid. Yeah, I'll send you like. Oh man, if, oh, I shouldn't. This is not a good for a podcast format, but I'm just laughing Dude, about some wait. of these old bits. There's literally a joke. Called so the name of the shark for everyone listening. His name was Spielberg. Yep, was the name of the shark, obviously. And uh, there's an ep- there's a bit called Spielberg shakes his package, yeah. and he just sh- <laughs> he shakes the uh, like a present, and it kind of looks like he's masturbating, and that's the whole bit. <laughs> he just shakes it, and I go, "Hey Spielberg, what's in your package?" <laughs> he's like, "Oh, it's so dumb. <laughs> it's not funny, but I love it. I love it. It makes me laugh." Oh, um, I'm gonna send you this link right now on Twitter, but. Please yeah, do. man, like, it's a lot of really, really groovy stuff that I've worked on. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really proud of the stuff that I've made. I, I hope that I get to continue on this path and continue to make cool stuff. And, you know, we are just, Steve and I have been talking about how to turn this show that we're doing now into maybe something bigger and something more substantial, closer to like, what you saw with our road trip with Matt Martin, for those of you that have that have seen uh, Black Series Rebel stuff like that, I think probably is more where the show lives than what we're doing now. But, you know, like baby steps, got to take one thing at a time. Sure. So. You got to grow. And you guys, I mean, we can't have you on and not talk about Black Series Rebels. First off, congrats on one year. 
It's Thanks, amazing. man. Big, big, big deal, man, to be doing stuff like that consistently and how quickly you guys have grown. I mean, you said you've listened to the episode with Steve, so you know how I feel about you guys. It is no <laughs> secret. <Thanks. laughs> and, dude, it's amazing how quickly you guys came on, and it just it just clicked, you know? You were obviously uh, something the fandom needed, and uh, I love it. I love it. I love the pins. It's such a good idea. And the other thing is, like, something I'm a big fan of with movies, franchises, anything, I love things that have, like, an already established universe. And this ties in because you're, even back from, like, the first episode of Black Series Rebels, when you do, like, uh, all the hashtags, which are hilarious. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, like, the, the, the catchphrases. The, uh, where did the oh-so-minty-fresh start? I have to know. Uh... Just something that happened. I yeah. I, I mean, I think I, I don't know if I can take full credit for it because I feel like people say like like mint on card or mint in the box or like pretty minty fresh. Uh-huh. So I think I've I'm sure I've probably read that or heard that somewhere. But like the the oh so minty fresh. I think I I can't. I was like, we need to come up with like like a stupid way to review. <laughs> so, so I was like, let's come up with a really like a stupid catchphrase. And I said, Oh, so minty fresh. And then Steve said that, Oh my God, he's going to be so mad. Cause I'm going to make fun of him. But he came up with like asparagus and band-aids or something was like his. And he, he was so embarrassed with how stupid it was that he just, he kind of was like, I'm just going to do Oh, so minty fresh now. <laughs> so if you watch some of our older episodes, it's like, I give a, I, my, my good review is Oh, so minty fresh. And then Steve would like, like smelling wine would go like <laughs> with a side of asparagus and band-aids. And people like <laughs> people would watch that and go, what the hell are these guys talking about? <laughs> so like, I feel like it's one of those things where Steve, we're like, let's, hey, maybe we streamline <laughs> the craziness here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the Oso oh Minty Fresh just kind of came from like, we also too only ever give something Oso oh Minty Fresh. That's like, it, to me, I think that's funny. We never give anything a bad review. Right. I love it. I even if it. even if we hate it, we'll find something about it to give an oh so minty fresh. Like we drank a twenty year old can of storm oh, yes. the other week and we Brave. gave the can <laughs> an oh so minty fresh and then <laughs> now and then we were like the soda's not good though. Like obviously. <laughs> but oh, yeah, no, God. I think well, cause you know, our show we 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 try to kind of make it so that like we're like characters. Right. You know, it's not like Steve and I aren't really we're we're like that in person, but we're also very different from how we behave on that show. Sure. Like we're much more we're much snarkier. There's we're we're <laughs> cynical, we're grumpy, we're grumpy dudes, but like on that show, we make a conscious effort to have positivity because we always have wanted it to feel like the Wayne's world of Star Wars. Oh yeah. So it's like it's like Alex and Steve are two little characters that we play that are star Wars fans. So a lot of those like catchphrases and stuff, it's supposed to be like bad public access. (laughs) That's the, that's the charm. And I think that's what, I think just like the pins, I think that's what people resonate with it is that they feel like they're watching like their buddies. Exactly. Like Like we have like these little secret jokes that only they get or like little things that we do and it starts to become a thing. So like, it's crazy to me. Like when we are doing a convention and people come up and they'll be like, Oh, so minty fresh, like before a picture. And I'm just like, oh, that's yeah. bizarre. Right. I'm like that's, <laughs> that's great. But it's really funny to me that some of those things that I would consider to be so silly have really, people have really kind of latched onto in a cool way. It's fun. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It reminds me of, like, the idea behind, like, subtlety in, like, T-shirts. You know what I mean? Like, instead of wearing, like, a logo of a show, you have, like, uh, a subtle reference to the show. And you're like, oh, yeah. I also know what that means. We're, like, a th- it's a thing that we're mm-hmm. both in on. And that's mm-hmm. what you guys have kind of done. And I dig it. I dig it a lot. Well, you know, again, like, I would always encourage people to find their – creatives that they work really well with and steve and i have such an a, a good a good way that we work together and what i mean by that is like steve not only is he funny and great in front of the camera and 
does a great job with the news and is a great co-host. But his one of his huge strengths is he's an amazing producer. Right. So he makes it so I can accomplish crazy shit that I come up with. Right. Just like bizarre stuff. Like we're right now we're we're I don't know when this is going to come out, but right now we're gearing up for Comic Con next week. Yeah, you are. So. As we gear up for Comic Con, right, we're starting to come up with really stupid stuff that we want to do. <laughs> and spoiler alert, I w- we're interviewing uh, Steve Evans, who's the design lead for Hasbro Star Wars. Yes. He's like our, our big guest. And I was like, Steve, I want you to get cardboard cutouts of a bunch of terrible Star Wars action figures, and we're going <laughs> to set them up around Mr. Stevie. And he was like, What? I love it. It's like, yeah, I was like, I want a buff Luke. A buff power of the force, Luke. I want <laughs> Chewbacca and Bounty Hunter disguise from Shadows of the Empire. I don't know if you remember oh, that. Oh, yes, with the but weird eye thing. Pirate Chewbacca. Yes. He looks like a, he has a, <laughs> he's like Pirate Chewbacca with a flat top. And then, of course, we have a Sayo Bibble toy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and then I think the other one is Dexter Jetster. Is a Dexter Jetster. Your favorite. And I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep, exactly. And I, I, I was like, I get them. I need them printed on three – on. I need them three feet big, and I need them on foam <laughs> for, and I need them to stand. And he's like, what the hell are you talking about? I'm like, don't worry about it, man. I got an idea. And Steve <laughs> just, like, makes a couple calls, and he's, you know, we're going to make it happen. Oh my just God, like did being it. able to book Steve Evans or being able to schedule this thing at Lucasfilm with Matt Martin that we did the road trip. That's Amazing. all Steve. Really? That's all Steve. Yeah, man. I don't – you're – honestly, dude, it's a miracle that I remembered to – to take this <laughs> seriously i'm just bad at that i'm bad at scheduling i'm bad at planning it's not my forte i'm a procrastinator i am like i i, I am so busy in my brain at any Same. given time that i struggle with like getting stuff done that actually needs to get done oh yeah but what that then turns into what i bring to the show is I, two weeks later, will be like, hey, Steve, I want to take the story group to Denny's. <laughs> yeah. like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I want to take the story group to Denny's. And he, I'm, like, I'm, I'm going to tweet it. And I tweet it, Matt Martin, I want to take you to Pancakes. And he was just like, what the hell is this guy talking about? <laughs> I just did it every day. I did it every day for a month. I was there. Until finally, <laughs> Matt Martin was like, yeah, dude, I'll get breakfast. <laughs> And we instantly were like, all right, how do we do this? Because everybody – yeah, I just I – and I wore everybody down. I, got, I can't imagine how many followers we lost over that month. We had, we had one guy that wrote a comment that was like, listen, I really love your show, but it seems like Alex only does this to become famous with Star Wars people. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like – like because I asked Mott Martin to breakfast every day for two weeks. I guess <laughs> where would a, you get that idea? <laughs> I was, where would you get that idea, man? What are you talking about? I don't care about being in with the Lucasfilm story group. Yeah, please. But, <laughs> yeah. So like we have a weird sort of like chemistry that we've learned from being at Second City. Steve what's weird too is Steve has a really clear image of how he wants to accomplish the show. And then he sort of keeps my everything in check so right. like i i go nuts and i want to do fun crazy stuff and then steve is like okay we're gonna pluck out these pieces and i'm gonna put them together here and boom here you go now you have a show right so like when we came up with the pins i think steve mentioned this it was like originally a business card yep and then uh cody our pin designer was like what if we did like like a little pin that you know like what if we did like a kenner action figure pin I was like, oh, that'd be cool. And I was like, what if we do a business card that looks like the card back and we just pop it in, not center. We just pop it in where the bubble would be. And we instantly knew like, oh, that's going to – that people are going to like this. Like this is going to be really cool. Oh, yeah. And watching that little thing turn into this big thing – I mean the the pins to me – are a microcosm of the show they're a very small but also very big part of what we do because they fund everything that we do but the pins to me the way they've grown represent just the entire trajectory of the show so it's like the first which uh sorry steve i have to correct you he got our he got the times wrong because i'm the (laughs) e-commerce site the first pin sold out in a month which was farm boy 
-hmm. The next pin sold out. The next set month after was Beep Boop and Goldenrod. Those sold out in two days. The next one was a day. And then after that, it was seven hours. And then it was after that, everything was under under two hours and now it's three minutes so it's now it's like insanity my god yeah i love it that's that's just a testament man to what you guys are doing out there crazy and in and in just a year that's the other crazy part of this you know what i mean it's not like something that's been cultivated over a super long time it's like it, it took a while to catch on but like dude in a year to go from like a month to three minutes yeah, it we you know we we have a super 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 supportive group of we call them rebels yeah. that are member, members of our rebellion and I think everybody was hungry I don't I don't know everybody has their own reasons for liking something but I feel like the thing that people really respond to with us like you said the catchphrases and things are they're a part of the community but I just think it's fun Agreed. And it, it should be fun. It's Agreed. not that serious. Yeah. <laughs> it should be. Like, Star Wars is cool, but, like, we've gotten – it's gotten so bad in the community that now, <laughs> oh, like, God. part of me is, like, we almost – I almost changed our whole – this last month, I told Steve, I was like, dude, I'm about ready to change all of our YouTube stuff to be like Netflix where you can't comment. Or <laughs> I don't you blame just, you. <laughs> just watch. You know, and for every – for every one horrible comment, we get a hundred amazing comments. So it's not – it's a super small minority that is doing the, the you know, the toxicity that is, that is that toxic member. Oh, yeah. But like that little bit seems so vocal at the moment. And I do think we've talked about it in length on our show. I think there are things that, you know, we're not perfect. Our show is not amazing and there are a lot of podcasts out there that are, you know, better and – more knowledgeable but one of the things i feel like maybe the folks at lucasfilm could learn from a show like ours is even if there's nothing to talk about get out there and push positivity find something to get fans excited about get them jazzed keep them you can stay ahead of the negativity you guys they're very good at what they do they know the job they have and it would not be hard for them to be like, oh, you know what? Oof, we're not announcing a female director this week. Right. <laughs> There's probably something we could do to help alleviate the stress and pressure we're under to become a more inclusive company. Let's do that. You know, little things like that. Oh, yeah. And then on the other side of things, it's, oh, boy, there's a um, a really vocal vocal group of people that – really don't like the last Jedi. What can we do to help them feel like their Star Wars is still their Star Wars? And honestly, the answer was always in solo. Right. But because they were they were so afraid to push that movie because of Infinity War, mm -hmm. Solo just fell to the back burner and all the people that hated Last Jedi for the reasons I, which I don't agree with, but they Same. are entitled to their opinion. Mm -hmm. Honestly, they kind of gave you everything you wanted in Solo. Agreed. And you just didn't see it because you were grumpy about porgs. Right. And, like, <laughs> like, so I think that, I mean, again, there are much better people running that franchise than I ever could. But I, I think that because of Steve and my energy and all of, the amazing people that watch and participate in our show and have either been guests or have retweeted or posted or bought a pin. I think all of that combined has really create kind of created a, an example of how a healthy community can exist within mm -hmm. itself. Agreed. As long as your intention is always to keep that community healthy and thriving for sure. You know? So I don't know. That's a really weird sort of like philosophical way to approach a really stupid show about Star Wars. But <laughs> you're talking to Jedi Brian here, Alex. Yeah, yeah. I, like and subscribe. Yeah, yeah, like. yeah. Exactly. I had follow, follow, follow. Actually, oh. don't. You'll immediately unfollow, guaranteed. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I I totally agree. I totally agree. And I'm all about like, there's something about passion that is infectious. Like 
I will listen to somebody talk about something they're passionate about, even if I don't even know what that is or have zero interest. And it, yeah. it's it's always so. I mean, if you hate nine out of ten things, let's talk about the one thing that you do like, you know, and that will change a lot of things. Such a crazy time. Such a crazy time. Yeah, man. It's amazing. Can you believe we've been talking for almost two hours? I know, dude. I'm I'm surprised my dog hasn't barked once. Yeah. <laughs> me, and, me and your dog had an agreement beforehand. I don't know if you heard it. Did you? Yeah, we yeah. talked. We're like, if you don't not talk in this, the other Alex is going to come and take you. And it's mm-hmm. like, mm, mm-hmm. don't want that. He's been arrested. I will say this. My dog is adorable, and I love him. <laughs> And you all should go follow at Captain Weenie on Instagram. Oh, more so my than watch Black Sea. Goodness Doubles. gracious, that's amazing, Captain go Weenie. Go follow Captain <laughs> Weenie. Go follow Captain Weenie. Oh, that's um, amazing. <laughs> yeah, I'll do. I'll pitch him more than I will pitch Shark Bites. I, I mean, will, or, or I Black will, Series Rebels. I will. I will say go follow both of those. Follow Black Series Rebels because they're amazing. I love the show. You guys are doing great work. I'm so happy to hear when good things are happening to good people. And I love that you're doing something at San Diego. At the Mecca, you guys are killing it out there. I'm very thankful to have you both as a part of this fandom and the internet and Thank you. all of it. Uh, go watch Shark Bites. It's hilarious. <laughs> Maybe I'll when you post this, let me know, and then what I'll do is I'll post the animated link so people can, uh, people can watch it finally. Sweet, <laughs> well, that'll be uh, uh, three more viewers for you. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> but uh, where can people find you online? Well, if they want to find me, I'm the I'm the the snarky person behind the Black Series <laughs> Twitter account. You can find us at BLK Series Rebels like look series rebels <laughs> or you can find me at alex underscore bacchus b-a-c-k-e-s on twitter i'm also on instagram all that good stuff shark bites but shark bite again shark bites has been dead for not dead it's, it's in hibernation for That's six right. years That's uh right. hibernation no creative idea ever really dies um yeah but uh, yeah, man, if you're going to be a Comic-Con and this this airs before, come by the panel. We're at 3 o'clock in uh, the Neil Armstrong Hall, I believe is what it is, in San Diego. We're at, the, we're at the, the library that's across the street. You need a badge to get in. It's like they now have so many panels. They've pushed panels out. So we're at like – we're in this beautiful like 300-seat theater. It's like stunning. I was like, oh, my gosh, we have no business here. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful space. You need a badge to get in. And if you go, we are going to be giving every person in attendance a free pin, a yet-to-be-announced action figure pin Ooh. available for free at the event. So, Dude. And it's pretty fresh. It's a good one. It is oh, so, so minty, minty fresh. fresh. <laughs> I love it. I love awesome. it. Awesome. This was fantastic. Dude, if you ever want to come back on, doors open. This was super. Yeah, fun. L- let me know. Maybe one time I'll come on and I I can nerd about nerd out about improv, maybe even harder than I can nerd about Star Wars. So of course, it would be fun. Of yeah. course, anytime. Awesome. So until next time, and. Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you enjoyed it, stop by iTunes, give it a five-star rating. It really does help push the show to the front of the algorithm so that more people can find it. Uh, If you'd like to follow me, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff as Jedi Brian. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. So until next time, be well.